Welcome to episode eight of Diversity Matters, a fireside chat series hosted by the PRCA's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. I'm Sai Roshni, a PRCA ed and committee member, and today we will be doing something different. We have with us a panel of three next generation leaders who are discussing their experiences with workplace diversity, equity, and inclusion. First off, we have Vera Lau, part of the PR Young Lions team that represented Singapore at the Cannes Festival of Creativity this year. Thanks, I Great to be here. Next, we have Maddie Holloway, Senior Account Manager at 50 Acres. Hello, thank you for having me. And also Zoe Chung, Digital Manager at Sinclair. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> These wonderful ladies that work in Australia, Hong Kong, and Singapore come from very diverse backgrounds. And today they will be joining me and my co-host Dominique, a fellow PRCA EDNI committee member, who will be helping to facilitate today's discussion. Nice to see you, Dom. Hey, Sai, happy to be here. So to just give a little context uh, on today's discussion, we're seeing more Gen Zs enter the workforce. And of course, with them, they bring a huge culture shift and new perspectives, especially today in the comms industry. Apart from more flexibility and work-life balance, Gen Zs wish to see ED and I issues prioritized. And according to Randstad, 57% of Singaporean employees believe it is important to work for a company that supports ED and I, especially amongst the Gen Z population. Thanks for that background, Dom. With that, let's jump into our first question. So what does diversity, inclusion, and equality at the workplace mean for all of you? To me, it's about ensuring that everyone is respected and given equal opportunities, no matter you know various aspects like gender or sexual orientation. And it's really about being part of an environment that ensures that all team members are heard and really understood. And you know, I can speak to aspects like gender and age that I've had challenges with but it's really about for me being part of a workplace that you know sees these aspects as recognizes these as differences but then you know views these as opportunities to bring new perspectives to the table and really value what you can bring. Yeah yeah I really like what Maddie was sharing and and you know I think I really agree with her answer um, just the challenges that come with that is that a lot of workplaces have good intention and there are usually like ED and I initiatives put into place. But, you know, at least in my experience and, and with my peers, I find that sometimes that channel um, doesn't fully exist, right? So from top down, right, management, you might have initiatives put in place, but yet, you know, people, especially um, more junior members of the team tend to feel maybe not as safe kind of voicing their opinions and they don't have the right channels to do that. So I feel like to me, that is a key challenge um, in these initiatives and also to me what is most important um, to be fixed. Yeah, definitely. So I think for most of the, us, uh, we were just very aware of the DEI initiative, but without having them in place, um, especially for the next generation, uh, the, our generation said, so they would just be like, oh, uh, when I was in the first day of work, you can already tell like whether or not you want to work in this company or not because you're just talking to the people around you and no matter whether like which initiative they in place for DEI that's the people matter and you would just be like how uh each of them could take place could could take a stake uh, into this to put them into everyday practices um, are they welcoming or even try to learn more about you? Are there people of colors or from different cultural backgrounds? And how is the workplace dynamic is really important to me personally. And mm -hmm. um, they can be very quiet and but they are actually sitting there and observe every details that you have in the workplace. So that's um, very important for me. And it, uh, the I uh, fall into my top three criteria to my job satisfaction. Yeah, uh, because <laughs> we spend like eight hours at least at work and we want to make sure we feel comfortable with the environment and be able to grow our career with fair treatment. Thanks, girls. That was really great. And 
Has there been any kind of challenges or issues that you've witnessed in the last couple of years that maybe you'd like to bring, uh, you know, shine some light on for us here? I think coming back to that generational divide, you know, there's a lot of, we've spoken about Gen Z and there's a lot of workplaces that, you know, we have people from all different generations and that can bring, you know, contrasting values or communication methods, biases, a whole range of things. And, you know, age-based stereotypes can affect anyone of any age and it can look at people and, you know, what are their abilities to take on tasks. And I think that as a young person in this industry, it's really important to feel like you have that voice and can really be part of a team and be on projects where, you know, you're seen to bring your ideas to the table. And it's not just for an example, you know, uh, I have a colleague, Hannah, that I work very closely with, and she is a graduate. And we, you know, instead of being, you know, put aside to certain projects that they might not think that we have the experience, our team is kind of like, okay, what are, the, you know, what are, young people, what media are they gravitating towards or what are the latest social trends or what kind of thinking can we bring to the table? And then we're, you know, speaking with so many different people of different generations. And I think that's kind of, it can be a challenge, but then it can also be kind of flipped on the other side and put into be an opportunity specifically within this industry, I think. Yes, I truly recognise the generational bias or um, that different interpretation of behaviors is definitely something that it's, um, the older generation would be aware of. And so it's like how we can bridge between um, the Gen, Gen Z and also uh, the more senior person so that they understand that behavior is actually coming from their background. So for example, they're more digital savvy and that's why they like taking notes from an iPad. They actually paying attention to what you say uh, but they just prefer a different ways of like jotting notes or uh, putting their uh, summaries together. It's not like they are not paying attention to you. So the, um, we need to understand the difference between different generation and how they would approach to different things. Thank you for sharing that, ladies. I mean, that's really interesting. And I think it's even more interesting we're all from such diverse backgrounds, but that generational gap challenge is definitely something I've experienced even in Singapore here. Um, and I guess I want to just follow up on this with this question. Is Are there any um, further challenges you've experienced within your own markets or within your own backgrounds that you'd like to share? Yeah, no, thanks for the question, Dom. I think you know, just to build on to the generational thing, I, I've definitely experienced that as well. So maybe as like a younger person on the team, um, you know, previously I feel like I might have been boxed into maybe say certain tests or you don't really feel as heard, especially like, you know, in a brainstorming session, everyone's meant to be say equally heard. Um, but I do find that because of rank or age, sometimes, you know, some ideas are prioritized um, above others and it's not always because of the quality of the ideas, more so the person that is bringing the ideas to the table. So the generational one um, really exists. But one that I'd like to bring up as well is, is maybe one that, um, you know, I think quite close to heart for all five of us. So it might be more of a gender leaning sort of bias. Um, at least for me, I, I do a lot of uh, corporate comms and a lot of comms in financial services. Um, and what happens here is that I tend to work with a lot of spokespeople that are bankers or analysts, um, tends to be a very male dominated sort of industry. Um, and a challenge I found, uh, I'm not sure if you guys can relate, but a challenge I found is that I'm always that comms person um, trying to tell someone, you know, far older and has been in his industry a lot longer, um, what to say, perhaps what not to say, what messages to focus on. Um, yeah, I can see Sai kind of giving a little giggle. I'm sure you guys- I can see, I can see Zoe laughing there because that's clearly what she's been doing. Yeah, I know. More to share after you. <laughs> yes, please do, please do. Um, you know, I think it, it, it's quite interesting, right? Because at the same time, our jobs is to protect the reputation of the company or of our clients. Um, and then obviously from a spokesperson's perspective, they they feel and, and they do know their business and their industry. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes you have to reconcile. You got to really like clench your fist, sit up straight, and you got to tell them like, no, this is not what we're saying today. Um, this is the briefing document. And these are the messages. And this is what we're sticking to. And this is the reason why we're doing this. And, you know, you really have to grit your teeth and, and they can smell fear. Uh, so you really got to stand your ground. Um, I found that really hard to do, especially earlier in my career. But 
one piece of advice I got that I wanted to pass on uh, to you guys and to the people listening to this podcast is that, um, you know, they might be professionals in their domain of expertise, but we are the comms professionals. So they're just trying to do their job, but we're just trying to do our job as well. That's given me a lot of comfort. So I hope that helps some of you as well. But Zoe, please, please, please share. <laughs> I'm interested. I think this type of like biased conversation can bring us to the crisis as well. So we just need to make sure that that won't happen to the spokesperson. And we make, we're making sure that they are following the briefing notes that we provided. <laughs> so um, just very similar to uh, what uh, their experience, but mine experience is more to the leaning towards to the consumer industry. So predominantly there are some products that um, are men men are uh, more men focused and and also uh, the client feel like that they need to focus more to that um, population as well. But uh, nowadays, so we no longer have that narratives to talk about like, oh, that's very cool for gentlemen. And this kind of messaging would uh, make someone else uncomfortable. And even uh, men themselves would be like, oh, is that really for me? So we don't want to make this type of claim. And instead, um, how we can craft a more inclusive narrative and how we can trick the content angle so that it will not be just like one population focus. But um, uh, from the sales perspective, of course, they can learn from the demographic that, oh, that is coming from the male. But how we can make the messaging more uh, to an uh, inclusive manner is how we can uh, help the client to do that. And one other thing that I want to share is that the influencer choices are really important. And mm -hmm. if they are going for like a one gender bias choices, that would, could be a crisis. And I know that in industry standard, uh, when we are having um, different type of discussion, we always want to include not just um, uh, uh, male pre uh, dominant uh, conversation, but also the female uh, uh, voices. So we need to be very um, attentive to this, uh, how we can turn uh, the conversation to a more inclusive way. Yeah, yeah. I, I just really want to add that, add on to that quickly. Um, <laughs> Please. No, no. What's really interesting is that um, it can be quite, you know, there are a lot of sensitivities these days when it comes to preparing messaging and making sure that the messaging is inclusive. And a lot of that happens, um, you know, in the office with people like us, right? Like really considering what each message means, um, the target audience of the messages and ensuring that we're being very conscious about it. Um, and on the surface, like me saying it this way, sounds like, you know, 20, 30, 45 extra minutes of going through every single word and every single sentence to make sure everything's kosher. Um, but what's interesting is that it doesn't always have to be negative. Like it doesn't have to be more time spent to make sure that a message is inclusive. Um, a lot of times more time spent also means a better message that can result in better business um, results. So it's not like it's a either or, right? It's not like, you know, you're sacrificing business results or growth for being inclusive and for being conscious about DEI. A lot of times these things can come hand in hand. It's not something that like HR pushes and it's siloed from actual business um, goals and profits, right? It can be seen together. And I think it's our job as a comms community to kind of help bridge that gap, to help people see that these things can come together. I definitely agree with that. I think that we do have a great responsibility, I think, as in this industry to really ensure that diversity is seen. You know, we cover from annual reports to sending images to journalists. There's so many things that we do that actually diversity is seen. And I think that we really, you know, have a bit of that responsibility to make sure that who we're working with, clients, for example, are really understanding that. Um, so I do think that's, yeah, a really important point. And just to add one more point, <laughs> I feel, um, yeah, definitely we are, have, we are playing an important role to crafting a message because we are communicate to the general public. So it's sort of education to our next generation as well because we are setting the norm, like how we talk about things. and especially for, um, not for the corporate side. Corporate side, if they they are really want to um, put on their brand messaging in, and for the consumer side, if 
they are promoting a certain product or services. It implies that um, the general public would just take that piece of storytelling. So in so to like um uh turns into their thinking and it would subconsciously become what they believe. So I think in that case, it would be really important to have a uh, right messaging and how we incorporate DEI into it. So I guess all of you have had quite a few years of experience and, you know, so far, how have you feel, how have you felt like the communications industry might be able to create a more safe and welcoming environment for, you know, colleagues and um, employees of diverse backgrounds and making sure they have all of these different um, DEI uh, factors in place when they're making decisions as well. Thanks, Sai, for the question. So um, something quite interesting I found is that, um, you know, I think we're all girls on the panel here and we're talking a bit earlier about how sometimes um, as a female speaking to like an older male spokesperson, someone that's more experienced, um, there, there is a bit of that dynamic that is taken into consideration. Um, but, you know, on the flip side of the coin, uh, comms and marketing tends to be quite a female dominated industry. So actually, I do find that my male colleagues and counterparts sometimes feel a little bit more out of place. So I felt that was quite interesting. Um, so I went to I went to school in Singapore um, at NTU. And if I remember, there were like seven guys in my cohort studying comms and journalism. Um, so it's actually a very female dominated industry. And I can't imagine how that must feel for, you know, men and, and male, you know, male allies that, that are very, you know, conscious and sensitive to, to our needs, but then they kind of step around eggshells and they're really careful about what they say. And, and it's kind of cute seeing how they handle that female dominated sort of environment. But at the same time, I also wish that, you know, people didn't feel so much pressure about it. So I, I can share a story. Um, I have a couple of friends that are in PR that, um, you know, they're guys that I've been close to my entire life and, and they work in an office which is all females and they're like really cool guys you know they're they're by no means like obnoxious or mean but they just they just feel a lot of stress um, being in an industry that is described as kind of woke or progressive and they're very careful about what they say and I feel like they're putting a lot of undue stress in themselves so I felt that, that was kind of interesting and I wanted to give all the guys a shout out, um, anyone that's listening to this that is, uh, you know, an ally and is always helping female colleagues and, and you know, male colleagues alike. I just want to say, um, you go, we hear you. There's no need to feel pressure. And, and you know, it doesn't matter um, who you come to work as, as long as you're coming to work as yourself. And then I think that's all that really matters. That's so true. I literally was nodding the whole time because I definitely can relate. I've been in the exact same environment. And I think it really comes down to, like you said, conversations and being, you know, open to conversations from the outset as well. And, you know, being curious and acknowledging that there is a need to understand other people and get to know other people and really just kind of break those barriers and really have that self-management, you know, and then you people on the team, can I educate myself, get to know them and really allow them to, you know, speak up and be more embedded in the team. I think that the closer the team is, the more they know each other and can understand each other and relate to each other, the better kind of outcomes, you know, the more you can provide and give. And I think that it's not just leaders. I think it's everyone. I think everyone has a role to play. You know, you, I remember starting, you know, in my career and it could just be someone else, doesn't matter their role, but could, you know, really drive that inclusion and then make you feel welcome. So I think it really comes down to that understanding of just the need to yeah open up and have conversations yeah surely i think uh, open opening up to new members is the way to how uh, we can uh, make them feel included and just throwing back to the days when i was still a fresh graduate so i'm a type of person that uh, would listen and also observe like what others doing that's my way of learning and i tend tended to follow what my seniors do, not just the SOP of each task, but also the way we treat others. So not just colleague or maybe our vendors or clients. So whether or not we are having a respectful manners, I learned all that from my seniors. So I was I was really glad that I have that senior that set me a role model to how how we can create an inclusive workplace culture. And they are always making sure that um, 
they have lunch, uh, team lunches, including everyone, including the interns, because the interns are always the one who are like um, left unattended. And also they feel like, oh, we are just doing another groundwork. Uh, so how we can participate and also uh, contribute in your daily work or even the campaign ideas. So especially uh, now they are, they want more involvement in ideation, for example. So they just want to have more involvement and how we can bring that involvement uh, uh, together and as a team. And we just need to making sure uh, we came together and it's okay for us to make fun of each other. So that's how we make friends at work. And so I was really happy to stay in a healthy environment, but I recognize that may not be the case for everyone else. So I feel like the involvement of seniors and also the management of a company really hold the power of setting the norm and also create the environment that speaks to everyone and how we can make the conversation um, growing and also make you feel like you can be your authentic self. Yeah, yeah, I cannot agree more with what Zoe's kind of sharing here. Um, you know, I'm gonna open a can of worms here and say that there's like buzz that agencies can be catty or like, am I allowed to say the word bitchy? Um, so like that happens sometimes, right? I know like when I was in school, a lot of people were talking about their experience kind of um, interning in some agencies. And then you, you hear horror stories. I'm sure all of us have heard horror stories. Um, the industry is very small. It doesn't matter if you're in Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore. Uh, industry is very small. People know people. And then, um, you know, a lot of people have things to say about, about the comms industry. and can be quite scary, especially as a, you know, intern or as a graduate kind of going into the industry. You've heard horror stories and you're wondering how you can kind of fit into that and make sure that you know it doesn't how you can survive how you can survive I've heard that said multiple times like how can I survive my internship um and, and it's true right like um usually because of the nature of PR um and especially in agencies where you have a client for a long time when you have interns for a short period of time um it makes sense for them to help with you know more laborious tasks a bit more grunt work and then um, those things are time consuming and as a result they they feel a bit more siloed because how many people do you need to hold a mouse to media monitor right so like that one person has to be doing it by themselves and then they feel kind of siloed um, and and you're so right Zoe in that um, how seniors and people in manager positions like us how we react to newcomers uh, coming in that really sets the tone for the entire company so it really comes like top down from management right if everyone is welcoming and nice and I've had great experience with this um working in a team that's really welcoming it really sets tone like like you said Zoe like the first day you're there you already kind of know who you vibe with who you don't vibe with you you can sense um I, I see this meme that says um Gen Z shows up on the first day of work and quits because the vibes were off <laughs> and then the comment section goes crazy like um like I didn't know you could do that oh that's totally valid like I would totally do that because you don't want to stay in a company you can vibe with and like you know the workplace now is divided um it's it's it, is it boundaries or is it just too much um but I, I do kind of agree that on the first day based on how people speak with you and how open they are to, to welcome you and, and the vibes you, you can tell how how good a time you're going to have at that company um, and, and it really starts from people in kind of middle management like us. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think that it's like empathy is such a big thing. We've all spoken about, you know, the time we were interns or, you know, to really just take a step back and be like, you know, we've been here. What would we like? What would we want and expect? And, you know, that is just to be respected and welcomed. And I think that is, yeah, such a such a big part. Yeah. And actually, you know, what you guys are talking about, it really reminded me that um, we are all from such diverse backgrounds. And sometimes people in the comms industry may not remember that, okay, you've not always been in the comms industry. And so like when I first started, I remember uh, in PR, I was told something like, okay, the, the client just signed up for the C on the CE, you know, asked the SAE to onboard you. And I was like, what are these acronyms? And then just recently, I was like, um, I heard, you know, uh, okay, R1 is good to go. Uh, check when the FA is going to get to the client. What are these acronyms? Like, I was not, not as someone who didn't come always from the PR and comms industry, you know. This was something I had to really get used to. And it will really help internally if, like you said, senior management or the senior team members, even just have a quick chat, like, 
okay, you know, this means this. In our company, we use these acronyms for this. It's something like so, so simple as everyday language that can really just help you feel a bit more welcome and a bit, a bit more like, okay, I'm not an imposter here. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm doing great. And even something as small as language. Sometimes we would just fall into a black hole like, oh, uh, that person would help me uh, to do this work and this work and forget she's actually a blank paper without any knowledge. So we need to have that empathy, like just like Maddie said, we need to be more aware and think back the days that we are still uh, like fresh graduate, like how would would we uh, react or if we come across this type of task, so what questions will I ask? So it's more like asking questions or giving advice, uh, thinking of the perspective that who are you talking to? So because we are just too busy and sometimes forget like how and what we should talk to our interns or the new joiners. And it comes down uh, to an example that uh, I faced recently. Uh, so there are interns want to have more strategic involvement because they just learn whatever uh, are from the textbook and also from the lecture uh, from the university. So they feel like, oh, I need to have that strategic thinking and how I can get that from our internship. But in the reality, they may not have time like uh, Thera said, uh, because they just have limited time or they assigned for three months. The time is not enough for them to, to go that grow that much. And they need to uh, realize the, the reality and how uh, we can assign uh, more thinking to their daily work. So they feel that they are uh, stimulated and they are adding value to the projects that we are working on. So thanks girls. I feel like, you know, we've, we've covered a lot of ground over here. And, you know, what I really want to understand now is all of you are in very different positions and very um, doing very different things at work. And I, I just wanted to get a sense from you, you know, do you feel like your voice really matters? Um, and do you think that you're really being heard in the workplace? And how do you how do you make sure that happens? Is that is that something that you're able to do? For me, I definitely do. I'm I am very fortunate. I work in a very tight knit team. And I think a key thing with our team is that everyone is really part of the bigger picture. It's not like you're siloed off to one task and you're just doing that, but you don't really feel included in what's what, what are the objectives? What are we all working towards here? You know, we have an administration and projects team that, you know, they study sometimes, you know, they're working part-time, but they're still really ingrained in the team. And I think that, you know, no matter who you are in the team, we all have, you know, regular updates and we're all really involved and it's kind of from the outset like you literally join the team and it's like what's your unique skill set you know we've got people studying psychology so what can you bring to the table I think it's really about you know making sure that you're looking at each person and what can they bring and how can they be like how can you explain to them that and show them that they're actually contributing to the success of you know, the agency or the company, they're not just kind of coming in, doing their thing and then going. I think that's a really important part of, you know, really feeling heard and feeling valued and like your opinion matters is it when you're really ingrained into the team. I think, Maddie, you know what you said about coming from a small team and, um, you know, you, you guys have that openness and I guess open communications. Uh, and I coming from a small agency as well, I've really loved that about having a, a close knit. But uh, I understand that, you know, in bigger agencies, that's a bit hard to do. But then what is important there is that openness and having an open platform to have an open discussion with your leaders, have an open discussion with your senior team members. And I that's something um that is critical, I think, to have your own voice heard. Or even hear your junior's voice, you know, they might be trying to communicate something to you, but there could be a miscom somewhere, but if there's an open platform of trust and, um, you know, open comms at all time, I think that's that's critical. Yeah, I agree, Dom. I have worked in both a small and a large agency. And I know I say now, you know, we have a very close-knit team, but I think, like you said, the same can still apply in 
bigger agencies. And I think it really comes down to the people and the actions that they're taking to really open up that dialogue and, you know, make you feel like you actually can, yeah, have those conversations and feel like you're really part of it rather than just, yeah, really siloed. So, yeah, definitely agree. That building the trust is really important when we want to start up a conversation with like new joiners or like everyone in the team. I feel like when we have that platform to communicate and also we are not just chatting top line, but going into a two-way communication is really matters, not just for the work-related issues. We, we can always talk about if there's problems or an issue related to a sensitive issue, there's someone that you trust that you can talk to and maybe your mentor or your manager is not the go-to person. Like who in the, who else in the team can you talk to? Like if we provide that type of platform or system so they can be more trained and, and to see like how they can better handle the situation and without offending um, the person that you are talking to and having that open dialogue to make them feel comfortable and trust trusted to share whatever is in their mind. Thanks, girls. I think uh, that that was a really good one. I, I, I just wanted to see what, you know, do you think your leaders are doing enough? Do you think that there's more that they could do? Do you think that they could do better? Um, you know, I just I just would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, um, you know, you know, I, I feel like these days um, there are a lot of buzzwords. Um, it's not just DEI, but it's things like sustainability and ESG as well. Um, a lot of companies are, you know, we've won the fight in that it is important to have DEI initiatives. We've won the fight in that it is important to, to be sustainable and build sustainable businesses moving forward. So that has been established. Um, and I think at this point, it's been a couple of years since we've won that fight. Um, and a lot of departments have created frameworks and around documents, decks about how they plan to do this. But whether or not it actually gets implemented is a completely different story. And I think the danger here is when we feel like, um, you know, we, we talk about it at a town hall, we send a couple of decks around, we put it as part of the onboarding, but then we slap a bandage on it and then we never actually put it into practice. I think that's the danger here. So um, I'm not, you know, calling out any specific firm. And of course, you don't know how it is unless you're actually in the company, right? Because when you interview and when you ask around, a lot of people will say, you know, like, hey, we have these efforts to support, say, working mothers, or we have these efforts to support people, um, you know, maybe help them with their education, um, pay child care leave. Like there are a lot of things put into place that sound great in practice, um, but whether or not it actually gets used is is a completely different story, right? Um, so I'll give you an example. Like there are firms that I've come across that have say paid paternity paternity leave, um, and then that sounds really great in theory, right? It, it's it's uh, a move towards quality, gender equality. That's great, um, but then people feel pressured not to take it. Right. Or there are a lot of companies these days that are offering uh, unlimited PTO. But then again, people feel pressured not to take it. So then what's the point? Because actually, if you if you leave a company that has unlimited PTO, um, you don't actually get paid back for your leave days. And those were meant to be part of your entitlement, um, you know, as part of your labor policy, a certain amount of paid days. You should be compensated for that when you leave a company. But say if it's unlimited PTO and then suddenly you don't get that anymore, right? So in practice, it sounds good. It sounds like work-life balance. It sounds like supporting working moms, for example, with, with more time off. But in practice, that doesn't actually get done, right? So in terms of making sure, you know, your question was, Sai, what is management or leadership doing? I think it's important that we recognize not just to slap a bandage on and call it a day. I think it's important for people to lead from top up to show that they are taking paternity leave or they are taking unlimited PTO. They are leaving early to pick their kids up. Um, they are, you know, showing up as their authentic self, not just saying we'll accept it, but they are actually doing it as well. Um, I think that's really important. I think that's a really good point. And, you know, on that note uh, of being nice on paper, but not being uh, implementable, maybe it just leads in, leads into a great segue to our next question, which is, what kinds of successful EDNI initiatives have you seen, or have you guys been part of that you can share? I have a great, I have a good one to share. <laughs> it's actually launched by my ex colleague, um, who re relocated from Hong Kong to Vancouver, and um. So obviously Vancouver, they have their Asian community, but they're still facing some type of 
bias or stereotype. So their team at uh, the company is called Eliminate, launched a campaign called um, Reclaim Your Name. So actually a movement to fight against the systemic uh, uh, racism and microaggression against uh, Asians. So how uh, the campaign works is that they create a um, dictionary plugin for Asian names and it's actually um, uh, installed and implemented by Microsoft. So now uh, if you install that um, plugin across your office product, uh, you can actually um, uh, use that function and the Asian name will no longer marked as mistake because like previously, because our names are like with the little red lines underneath. So now no longer the case. I, I think it's really a, an amazing movement to counter that and normalize the Asian identity. I love that. I just love that. Yeah. So we really it. use it. <laughs> yeah, I, I will. Yeah, I'm going to totally download that now. <laughs> I wish there was one for gender as well, because I've had so many people come up to me and be like, oh, Dominique, you're a lady. I thought you were a dude. So we need we need Microsoft. Please come up with a gendered one. Thank you. <laughs> and some someone will uh, regard me as male as well. So they would ask what, uh, whether you have the Y like, behind the E. That's so funny. <laughs> I think also, you know, circling back to just the need for these initiatives to be authentic and not just, you know, good on paper. I think even just like as an example of um, 50 Acres started, the agency I work at now, Joe Scar, she founded it um, off the basis of really wanting to make a workplace that was accessible for all. She was a working mother that was in parliament and she was a journalist and she founded the agency as a remote agency with a real focus on flexible working. And this was, you know, pre-COVID and, you know, she's, it was in 2010. So she's really wanted to make a workplace that, you know, suited her and was able, you know, she's been able to, you know, have this successful career as a working mother and now a managing director, Tammy Wayne Elliott. She is a mother of three and she, you know, pops out for her, um, you know, drop her kids off and she's able to, you know, work in this career in a way that works for her. And I think all the initiatives are really tailored to that specific life, you know, it's a uh, space of life and the time for it, for staff members and stuff that actually works. And I think that that then kind of shows, I think it's really important as a woman in this industry to be able to look at other women that are, you know, leading these successful careers and able to have that flexibility and feel included in an industry where, you know, I know years ago they were kind of struggling with those factors and now being able to kind of, you know, re, you know, calibrate and actually, you know, move forward. And I think that the fact that it's really ingrained in the agency rather than, you know, just something that's on paper is really important. All right, thank you so much for sharing that, ladies. Um, so we'll move on to our final question. And that is uh, the PRCA ed &I committee is working towards creating a charter for the comms industry across APEC. What is the one thing that you strongly believe should be captured in, in the charter? Yeah, thanks, Dominic. I will go first. Um, I think it's really important to have that education at workplace um, and making sure that we are not just having uh, those regulations on paper, but we are providing enough uh, tools and also resources for all uh, employees across all levels to learn about, discuss, and also ask questions about issues or topic related to DEI. And so we how we can uh, make it measurable and in a sense that we are uh, continuously updating um, uh, what is the best practice in the industry and how, um, are we uh, knowledgeable and also equipped with those uh, tactics? How to come uh, to come uh, to handle those situations? That is really important. And sometimes it might not be um, the people don't want to do it; just they don't know the ways to do it. So when we provide the tools and also uh, resources for them to understand the AI, um, so they would have. Uh, have that empathy to understand each other's uh, without bias or like any other uh, stereotype towards um, 
a certain uh, identity? Um, I think for me, it's that, um, you know, quality knows no bias. Um, so to me, it's like, you know, I shop to work and I want to do great work and I want to work with great people and I want to learn and I want to make sure that the work that we're putting out has good quality. And, and the reality is that that can come from anywhere and anyone. It doesn't matter how old you are, how long you've been in industry. Um, you know, a lot of times actually good new ideas come from people from different backgrounds, right? Because, you know, I believe that nothing is really truly original. All ideas that we come from is like a weird concoction of things we've seen before, uh, things that have worked, things that we've encountered, our life experiences. So when people are willing to kind of, you know, listen and put that together, you get diverse, you know, more diverse ingredients to put into your concoction, if that makes sense. So if everyone has a quirky thing to share, we put that together into a, to a winning portion, right? So quality can come from anywhere and we need to be open-minded about who we're listening to and who we're asking for input. And for me, I know that we spoke earlier around, you know, the responsibility as practitioners to really ensure that messaging um, is, you know, diverse. And I think that imagery is a big one as well. And I know I touched on that, but having guidelines around ensuring that there is diversity in images, it's a big thing in Australia. And I know it would be a big thing everywhere, but I, you know, when we're sending images out to journalists, making sure that there's a diverse mix of cultures and genders, um, websites, are the clients that we're working with, do they have a diverse mix influences? You know, it kind of covers so many different aspects of the work that we do as communications professionals. So I definitely think that that's really important around, you know, guidelines for those gender diversity and images. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, Maddie and Zoe, that common thing of having guidelines and putting something on paper is definitely something we need to reflect in our charter. Uh, and Vera, I really liked your sentence on quality knows no bias. Um, I feel that. Uh, and I know I said that was the last question, but we have a final, final one that will wrap um, this whole conversation up. What would be one thing from each of you that you would like to leave our listeners with to inspire them and motivate them to start get started on their ED&I journey? The one thing that I would say is, actually this is, I'll try and keep it to one thing, um, but really just to be curious and willing to learn more about, you know, the people that you work with and increase your understanding of differences in the workplace as well, I think is really important. You know, the more that you know about someone, the more, you know, the better that you can work with them and, you know, be able to offer more together. So I think just really, you know, educating yourself on differences and then, you know, getting to know everyone and just being curious. That ties in perfectly with mine. So mine is to not assume because assuming makes an S out of you and me. <laughs> so the thing is that when you don't know something about a person and then, you know, like Maddie said, you don't make efforts to go learn more. You, you tend to take one little thing and then you assume and extrapolate their entire personality and all their intentions and all of that. So try not to assume. Um, yeah, ask, talk, try not to assume. Mine is very similar to... <laughs> two of you um I would just say talk to someone else because um it's very easy to for us to just put on labels on uh, others because it's uh through categorization you can just um oh interpret how they think and what uh type of person they are but actually by talking to that person you will be um, surprised like how different you think they are and versus they actually are so having that human to human conversation is the basic thing that we are going for so not having uh, labels or assumption and embrace the differences among each of us like that's what I wanted to do Thanks, girls. That was great. Actually, Vera, that's really funny because I actually used that line on someone this week. <laughs> so don't assume. Anyways, um, well, thank you so much, girls, for sharing your thoughts and um, being, as, being a part of this episode of Diversity Matters. And to everyone listening, um, to our audience, we want to hear from you. So do share your thoughts with us. You can email us, DM, or even just comment on the conversation. And we'll be more than happy to pick up on some of the things that you bring up in future episodes as well. 
So feel free to also share this conversation with your friends and your colleagues. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.